Hey, enough of my books. Let's talk about yours author, C.K. Brooke here. And I've got with me on the line, the one, the only, the queen of science fiction herself, E. Ardell. Ebony, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Actually, I'm in Cali, so it's not quite evening yet. Oh, that's right. So for you, it is, what, you're three hours behind, so five o'clock? Nice. You've got the it's getting kind of dark. yeah, yeah. This time of year for sure. Um, yeah, it's completely dark here in Detroit. <laughs> so, folks, for those of you who might not be familiar with E. R. Dell, um, she is a science fiction writer. She spent her childhood in Houston, Texas, obsessed with anything science fiction, fantastic, paranormal, or just plain weird. She loves to write stories that feature young people with extraordinary talents thrown into strange and dangerous situations. She took her obsession to the next level, earning a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Southern Maine, where she specialized in young adult genre fiction. She's a big kid at heart and loves her job as a teen librarian at Monterey Public Library in Monterey, California, where she voluntarily shuts herself in rooms with hungry hordes of teenagers and runs crazy after school programs for them. When she's not working, she's reading, writing, running writer's critique groups, trying to keep up with a blog, and even writing fan fiction as her guilty pleasure. Her first YA science fiction novel, The Fourth Piece, was released by 4814 Publishing in July 2016. The Fourth Piece went on to win the Bronze Medal for YA Science Fiction in the Reader's Favorite Book Awards 2017 contest, Most Promising Series in the Red City Review Book Awards 2017, and to be a finalist for the 2017 Roan Awards for Young Adult Science Fiction slash Paranormal. Wow. <laughs> so... That is quite exciting, all that you have accomplished in this area of young adult literature. So um, I want to do with you what I've been doing um, with everyone I've had on this show so far. Um, and I'd like to ask you how you got into writing in the very beginning. Oh, how I got into writing at the very beginning. Um, so the first story I ever remember writing when I was seven, it was called The Apple Tree. So ever since I was a little kid, that's just what I did. And you know, as I got older, the stories got longer. I attempted to write my first chapter book when I was in third grade. And then from books, I started writing plays and casting my friends in them. And then when I got to college, I decided, okay, well, let's try to be serious. And I took some college courses. I took creative writing my senior year at Baylor University. And that's where I met a professor who was like, okay, if you want to be a serious writer, here's some possible career paths. And he was like, number one, you want to try to get a master's in writing or a master of fine arts so that you could be a teacher. And then that way you can teach during the school year and then have your summers off to write. And I thought that sounded fabulous. So from there, I went on and applied to some Master of Fine Arts program. It was a windy road. I finally got accepted into one, which was uh, Stone Coast University of Southern Maine. And, you know, I worked very closely with mentors on actually the fourth piece, even though it was called the sixth piece. And, and when I graduated from there, that's when I found out, hmm, I have an MFA, but to actually teach writing, they want you to have experience in published books. And that's something that I didn't have. So I actually ended up having to go back to school and get another degree in just teaching and then from there, I went into librarianship. And then when I became a librarian and took my job in Monterey, one of my coworkers is actually a poet. And he told me, oh, so now we have two writers on staff. And, you know, I'm planning on retiring next year. So, Ebony, I challenge you. I want you to have your first published book in my hand by the time I retire. So because he set that goal for me, that when I was like, okay, I'm going to be serious about querying and going to writers conferences and learning what I need to do to get this thing on the shelf and in published format. So from there I set out, did my queries, went to all sorts of conferences, writers groups, and lo and behold, got my acceptance letter from forty eight fourteen. My first book came out. I put it in my coworker's hand and he didn't retire until hmm. He actually retires at the end of this month. So I actually <laughs> too so then we became the published authors on the staff 
And, you know, the library really, really likes having published authors on staff, so they give us a lot of opportunities to go out and do outreach and talk as published authors. Ebony, that's incredible. You know, as I always say on here, everybody's journey is so unique and so different. And you have really taken the route that when people ask me, Uh, what I would have done had I known what the hell I was doing when I began. And if I could go back and do it all over again, what would I do? Um, You took the route that, you know, I think a lot of us wish we would have taken, um, which was really educating ourselves thoroughly and, and planning. I mean, it sounds like you have had this plan in your heart uh, from the beginning that you wanted to be a professional writer and you did everything in the order that it should be done to to pursue that so i commend you um i want to know because you know as somebody who wants to be a professional writer i mean you could have dreamed of writing anything you could have wanted to write your memoirs because you know you're very well you've lived all over the country texas maine california you know you could have written travel logs or or um literary fiction so what is it about science fiction that appealed to you, including were there any authors or fandoms or films or, or anything in the science fiction world in particular that influenced and inspired you? You know, somebody else asked me this question, and I was like, me and my sister kind of didn't have a chance when it came to being science fiction nerds because my dad, we, he basically raised us watching Star Trek. And then when Star Wars was re-released in the 90s, he took us to all the new releases. So we didn't have a choice. We were going to like science fiction. <laughs> so you were born into it. You were initiated from <laughs> from birth. Yeah. And then my favorite things to watch, like as a kid, I was in a Ninja Turtles, Sailor Moon, anything with magic and people transforming. So you just knew that's what I was going to write. So when you had mentioned that you wrote your first chapter book in third grade and that you had written plays um, in your grade school years that you had your friends perform, were those all science fiction as well? Actually, they were. That's really funny. In third grade, the chapter book was called The Alien Spaceship. It was awful, but that's what it was called. (laughs) And then the plays usually started off as something normal, but I couldn't stay that way. So it started off as kids in school, but by the third installment of the play, the aliens had landed and they had to deal with doubles that looked just like them. So (laughs) So the aliens have have been a part of it for since time immemorial for you. (laughs) And so so it's kind of (laughs) So that kind of naturally like okay, so so you had to have your first published novel in the hand um of I'm sorry, did you say it was your your coworker, your boss? Your, uh, in your co-worker's hand um, by a certain time. So uh, what inspired you or what, what drove you to write not only the first book, but the first of a series as opposed to a standalone? Well, what it is, is this series is actually one that started when I was in the sixth grade. So these characters have been around for a while. So I've been dabbling in different versions of their story and you know how you do story starters, you write a, mini, a middle with no beginning or an end. So I, I had bits and pieces of their story everywhere and all these character diaries and journals. So I always knew that that was a story that I wanted to publish. I just didn't know how to tell. I knew all about these characters. I knew their bad stories. I knew what I needed to do, but I needed a plot. So I worked with that all through graduate school. And then I shelved it because I got a little disheartened by, you know, some of the feedback I got. And, you know, worked on other projects. But when I was little... I have a younger sister and I used to babysit her all the time and you know I would tell her she basically had to listen to my stories and things about my characters since she was very very young too and so she knows so much about my characters that you know I said oh we lost you like oh so what would happen if they were in this situation so she grew up with those characters and when she heard that I solved the project about these other stories that you keep coming out with when are you going to get back to these Ledreth brothers you know they were my favorite and I really wish you would go back to their story so I was like okay I started when I became serious about pairing and such I was like okay it's going to be this story but I need a version of the story that works so I went back into working with that and I always knew it was going to be a series because their story is so big it can't possibly be told in one book 
Wow. So, so these characters and this storyline has been brewing since you were in sixth grade. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. So, so really you have just been spending these, these years in kind of honing and polishing and reshaping and, and, uh, creating new incarnations to, to tell these characters stories. So, um, yeah, I often tell people it, it doesn't happen overnight. Usually, you know, (laughs) some of us will carry these things with us for years or, or bits and pieces of them. So, um, so my next question that I had written down was, you know, what your writing process is like. I mean, it sounds like you have been writing as part of your, um, as you pursue degrees, as you pursue your career, um, do you have a certain, a certain room you go to, a certain pen you use, a certain, um, ritual, you know, to your writing at all, or is it just, uh, whenever you can find time? I wish there was a ritual or a special pen I used or a special room I went to because I probably have more of a writing schedule. But basically, it's whenever I have time, wherever I am, if I'm in bed and I'm like, okay, I can write now, I pull out my little laptop. If I'm in a coffee house, okay, let's write. If I'm at work on break and nobody's talking to me, okay, let's pull out the computer and write. It just happens when it does. So are you one of those writers you can write in like a public setting and just tune out the background noise? I'm really weird. I actually need background noise. So even when I'm at home, I turn on the TV, music, all these random sounds. Or else I can't concentrate. Even even music with lyrics? They don't jumble up your, your writing process? Okay, that's one thing. When it comes to music, there can't be words because I'll start to sing and I'll start to dance. I'm so the I'm same like, way. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's distracting. I can watch whatever I'm doing, even though it has to be something that I've watched a whole lot. So mm-hmm. I know exactly what's happening. And yeah, I will stop what I'm doing to go watch my favorite part and, you know, say all the words and then I'll come back. But it's not as distracting as music lyrics. <laughs> Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, any particular bands that you, or, or go-to playlists? Uh, you know, I used to write a lot to the Lord of the Rings soundtracks and to the, um, Mist of Avalon soundtrack. Oh, those are great. Like, well, yes. Music. Oh, you like that one? Oh, yeah. I love this sound. But my latest thing now is K-pop. And it's like, well, I don't understand what they're saying anyway, so that's fine. Oh no, that's interesting. K-pop. So, so does that kind of get you into like the teen spirit since you're writing young adult? <laughs> yeah, let it have that fast speed. I'm like, okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah, kind of pumps you up a little for it. That's that is too cool. Right, right. Um. So, so how long did it take you to finish the fourth piece from start to finish? Like not not from the conception, you know, in sixth grade, but but when you actually sat down to write the uh, rendition of it that is published now. How long did that did that take right. you? Okay, when I sat down and decided, this is the version I'm going for and this is the way I'm gonna do it, because I had to experiment with POV, <clears throat> excuse me, POV a lot too. Mm-hmm. So um, I probably started the version that ended up being published in maybe 2014, so it was probably a two year process. Okay, and when you finished it, um, well, I guess you kind of already had answered this question earlier because I, I had written here, what led you to look for a publisher instead of self-publishing? Would self-publishing have been accepted by your coworker as published novel or would that not have made the cut? It had to be traditionally published. That does sound awful, but he would not accept self-publishing. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Published. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I went publisher instead of um, agent, I went to the San Francisco Writers Conference, and you know, I shook hands with all these agents, and all of them were like, yeah, yeah, that to me, because I'm really, really good at pitching, so everybody wants the whole thing, but when it comes to actually reading the manuscript and accepting, they say, or I never hear from them again, Mm -hmm. but I met somebody there who was like, okay, I'm doing the same thing, and then she sent me an email later, like, oh, my work actually got picked up by, you know, a a small publisher, and they're going to put it out, and I was like, small publisher? I never thought of that before. And I was like, oh, I can query small publishers and agents. And so I changed the way I was submitting. And I was like, whoever says yes first, you know, that's kind of who you're going to go with because you don't know who else might say yes. That's right. So I was just 
submitting, like, I was like, okay, we're going to submit five every night. Two to agents, no, I did three to agents, two to publishers, and I just went down the list like that. And so you have kind of a funny story about um, 4814. So you're sort of notorious for not following rules and <laughs> for not reading the instructions. <laughs> and that, and <laughs> <Ethical workers. laughs> so tell us, well, first of all, did you have the fourth piece sitting with any other publishers or agents at the time that um, 4814 was looking at it? Mm-hmm. And I sent queries out to a bunch of different people. But while 4814 was actually doing the manuscript read, I want to assume no. Okay. So um, tell me, first of all, tell me how you found specifically 4814. And then tell us the story of how you managed to kind of grab the publisher's attention through your your rebellious, maverick-like <laughs> lack of reading the instructions. <laughs> like helping you <laughs> right, right. Like, good on you I'm like first generation millennial we don't read the instructions we try it first and then when we break it we read the instructions exactly that <laughs> i always tell my husband the same thing we get something in the mail and it's like i don't need to look at that i can figure it out and if i can't figure right. it out then that's when i consult the instructions <laughs> right and see when you're figuring it out you learn all the little traps and pitfalls so it's like okay now i read the instructions but there are things I can teach other people not to do. And I learned these <laughs> like, you don't actually have to do that. You can do it this way. But um, the way I found 4814, I actually have um, the writer's market. And I got the online version of it. So they have places where you can say, okay, I'm looking for small publishers or publishers that are accepting unsolicited manuscripts. And agents that are looking for unsolicited manuscripts. So I was just getting lists, and then I would narrow that down and say, okay, people who are looking for YA, people who are taken from new authors, and, you know, I got this long list, and then I was just like, you know, even Writer's Market isn't hitting up all the publishers and agents that are out there, I don't think. So I started doing some standard Google searches, too, and, you know, as a librarian, I know how to suss out the ones that aren't so good. So mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, you know, let me start searching this way. And 4814 and a couple of other publishers did pop up that way. And I was like, well, okay, let's learn and see who they are. And I was like, all right. I was looking at the website. I was like, it's pretty clean. It's well organized. The covers look good. I like the blurbs. And, you know, when you're looking for a publishing home, you always look at the manuscripts that have been published. And you're like, okay, do they publish things similar to mine? Like, how would mine fit in? Do they have anything that sounds too much like my book so they wouldn't accept it? And I went ahead and said, okay, well, I'm going to apply to this one as well. So I told myself instructions or apply or submit to anything late at night because you do things stupid <laughs> and well you know when you work full time and work night shifts sometimes you get home and you're tired and you're like I need to keep up with sending to five my two publishers my three agents and I hadn't done it and I was like you know what I'm just gonna go ahead and do it I have a standard query letter and this I'm just gonna paste it and send paste it and send paste it and send and all the instructions are kind of the same yeah that looks good paste it <laughs> So, I sent the 4814, I went to bed, and I guess my, my subconscious had read the instructions over my <laughs> So, in my dreams, my subconscious was like, you know, those instructions that submit a PDF, and I was like, uh, am I dream Because you know, sometimes you have those dreams where you think they're real. Yeah. So, I was like, well, maybe it was just that weird dream freaking me out, but I got up, and the first thing I did, because I actually sleep with my laptop. Because, you know, sometimes I'll write late at night. Because I'll writers. Write. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Exactly. Yep. Put I'm it under the bed. So <laughs> yep. I hardy laptops. <laughs> but I grabbed my laptop, opened it up, pulled up the page, and lo and behold, my little dream devil was right. You did this. So I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Because I know when you submit to publishers and agents, they get so many submissions that they're just looking for a reason to say, I don't have to read this one because they can't read. That's right. Because they, read they read. didn't follow the instructions. So, yeah. Exactly. So I was like, oh, my gosh. So I combed that website and I found 
found the publisher's email address and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I did not follow the instructions. I throw myself on my hands and knees. Will you let me reattach it properly and send it again? And the publisher was nice. She was like, oh, oh, um, sure. And because she had to go find my original submission, she was like, actually, this is fine. And your query letter interested me, so I'm going to go ahead and read the sample chapters. And I was like, oh, 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 okay. So then I swear a couple hours later, I got another email. Go ahead and send me the manuscript. And I said, oh, oh, oh okay. So I sent that. And then, you know, my coworker, the one that I had told, the one that told me I had to publish before he retired was like, oh, oh, what's going on? And I was telling him, so he was getting excited too. So then, you know, a week goes by. And, you know, it's close to Halloween. And me and my sister, being science fiction nerds, are also big Halloweenies. So, you know, me or her visit each other. We both live in different states for Halloween. So, you know, we're going to Target, getting our final goodies for our costumes because we go all out. And my phone buzzes and it's an email from 4814. And it was like, you know, I read your whole manuscript. I would like to extend an offer for us to join the 4814 family. I really love this. And I was just... <gasps> It's happening. So we left Best feeling here, ever. And I drove straight, straight to work on my day off to tell my coworker what happened. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> I think I called everyone I know that knows I'm a writer. Because, you know, when you're first starting, it's a, not a lot of people know that you actually write. You don't tell them. Right. They ask too many questions and get on your nerves. Right, or they, yeah, or they start to, like, offer um, advice that you don't want. <laughs> That is, that it was, it's the best feeling. I was, I was surrounded. I was at like a little family reunion dinner and I was surrounded by my family when I got my offer letter from them, which was my first offer letter ever. And it was like, I had checked my phone and I just started like screaming at the dinner table. So, and everybody was like, what, what happened? And I'm like, just screaming. <laughs> was it for the Duchess class? Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> so. That is so, it's an awesome feeling, but I think only a writer or somebody who's getting into the, to the genre or business understands that feeling. Yes. Well, in my case, I had been rejected 164 times before that offer <laughs> letter. <laughs> oh, you so, counted. Oh, I had, an, I had an Excel sheet. <laughs> and it was numbered for me. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> I think part of the problem was I submitted it to places that like didn't even take that genre. So I was just, I was just, you know, shooting from the hip. Um, <laughs> again, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't plan out my process very well. Um, unlike you, you have been, I, so I've been, I've been watching you since your book was published July, 2016. Um, I've been just marveling at you. <laughs> Watching you just <laughs> kill it with the marketing. With I, I think in a single month or two, you managed to grab more reviews on your book than I've, ha you know, been able to get in years on some of mine. So, I mean, I guess you sort of answered this above with just what with all of your experience and all of your research and being a librarian um, that you seems you knew where to go and and. Uh, what sites and what places to go to to market your books, to get reviews, to get editorial reviews, things like that. Um, so could you share a little a, a little about um, how perhaps being a librarian, um, especially particularly being a teen librarian, helped you find um, outlets and an audience for the fourth piece? Um, well, you know, the librarian part finding like reviewers and such that was for me living in this area and this area is very very friendly to writers so there's so many different writers groups and conferences and like different chapters of the california's writers club and i joined this one called south bay and they have marketing meetings so i had actually went and there was this lady there who is just fabulous and she's also an awesome YA author and she was like this is how I market this is what you need and they had all these work sheets and they basically told me all the things that I needed to do and where I needed to go so I went into this knowing okay if I get this this is what I need to do I'm gonna try to copy them but as a librarian what it did for me is number one bosses are thrilled
thrilled to have published authors on staff. It gives us prestige. So, and then being a teen librarian, of course, teachers reach out to me like, oh, can you come and teach a writing class for my English class? Or I have a creative writing elective. Could you come and be a guest author? Can you come speak? So that got me through the doors of a lot of schools. And then I would have the book as a prize. Like I would give the kids raffle tickets and at the end I'd call a number and they'd get the book. And then I heard the teacher say, yeah, they've been passing your book around. Everybody needs to read it. And then I lead a teen book group. And of course they were like, oh, we want your book. And um, the friends of the library were like, well, I think they should be able to have it. So they actually purchased some books for the kids to have. And then um, because of uh, my writing experience, because in, you know, I'm the teen librarian, the boss was like, well, you know, teen librarian, yes, and I know you have a teen writers group, but it's okay for you to have an adult writers group too. So I started an adult writers club at the library. And, you know, I bring in newbie writers and people who are published and such. And from that group, I actually met a lady who got me to get into a college on NPC to do a lecture on writing. So I've just been branching out. And then I joined um, this other writers group where they had me come and talk and I was able to recruit writers to come and do independent author days and such at our library and come teach other writers or starting writers how to get started. We had like different workshops and classes and all that just goes on my writing resume, but I'm doing it as the teen librarian at Monterey Public Library. So you really speak to the proof of it's not about, you know, just how many websites you go pay $75 or $150 for a blog tour or, you know, it, some online review thing. You really speak to the power of it's, a, it's about people. It's about your physical in-person connections, physically going to these groups, um, to these workshops and meetings and interacting with people as a writer, interacting with other writers um, face-to-face and those personal connections. And I have found them because I'm very introverted uh, when it comes to my daily life. I have no problem um, talking to people on the internet, but actually physically getting my butt out there and and physically driving somewhere and going, you know, and being in front of people, um, is, has been a challenge for me, uh, my whole life. So I have, um, avoided that for years and it was, but it really only was just a few years ago when I started doing, um, conventions, book signings. I joined the Romance Writers of America. I go every month. I've made friends. And it's really those people and that community that um, I find are the ones that are like really supporting and, and buying my books and, and just becoming my team. And so you've really, um, what you're sharing is so valuable because um, you are also adding to the proof of that, that as writers, we tend to be introverts. We don't necessarily want to go out and talk to people. That's why we're comfortable alone in a room for 40 hours writing. (laughs) But, um, But making those personal connections is so important if you want your book to have a broader audience. Um, so that's, that's wonderful. Again, in, in so many ways, you know, you have, you have done things, um, the way I wish I would have done them. I just insist on learning the hard way. <laughs> Cause as you say, that's that, that first generation millennial stubbornness. <laughs> we, we have to do it our own way, uh, first. Um, well, I do want to say that when I talk about it, it does kind of seem like things fell into place but it was a windy road and a lot of people were just like I think you're directionless we don't know where you're going with this and really like, okay let's throw stones to slay it that way in my opinion I think everything I did built this but it, it took much longer than I, I wanted it to oh yeah it it does tend to feel like it's taking forever on our end of things but it's so funny from the outside um because you said it took you two years to complete the manuscript and so during that time, were you, you were attending these meetings and workshops and such? Or was that after you yes, finished it? I had, I had just moved to Florida to accept my first reference librarian position full time. And I joined a writer's group there. And a lot of the writers there were hardcore. So they really made me knuckle down because I was going to see them once a week. So it was like, okay, once a week I need a submission. And it has to be this long. And then in that writer's group, 
once again, I networked and I met, you know, a couple special people where I was like, okay, you guys are really pushing me to go forward. And we started meeting outside of groups. I started doing more pages. And that's really what pushed me to finish that manuscript in such a short amount of time. Gotcha. So again, there, though, we have the power of, of you know, in-person support of people, you know, people kind of um, setting the pressure on us and, and in a way that really helps us achieve our goals. So um, that's just brilliant. Um, I want to know, too, how um, so you are a female writer, but your cast of characters in the fourth piece is mostly are mostly male. So what do you feel enables you as well as holds your interest as an adult woman to write from the point of view of a group of teen boys? Um, Well, another author, I swear we share consciousness because she writes this one series and I read her author's note where she was like, oh my gosh, these four teenage boys camped out in my brain for 10 years. And I was like, same. (laughs) What are the odds? sprung to life like a theater in my brain and they've been there so it's like okay i have to write about them and they tell me what they say and i know it's like you have some kind of mental disorder when you say things like that but that's how authors talk when i talk to other authors i'm like oh good, i'm not crazy that that's how you do it you say the characters talk right but um to keep my interest actually my main interest and i tell people if you really want me to read something if you tell me you got romance in your book Oh, yeah, I'm all about it. I love romance. Like, my first love was King Arthur, Lancelot. Like, I love the original romance. I love the show Supernatural. Anything that has that topic or genre, I'm in it. Is there anything in particular... Something like that, too. Is there something in particular about bromance that that you can pinpoint that appeals to you? or, Or it's one of those things that just does... Watching Animal Planet. I love it. Right? <laughs> I was like, I have to write this. This is hilarious. Oh my gosh. So so it's the bromance and it is the um <laughs> the the exotic secret life of, of bros. <laughs> right? I just I don't it's so weird, but it's funny. You're just like, gosh. And their thought process. Like I just asked the guy friend, you know, because he would read chapters for me and I was like okay tell me if they sound like authentic males and he's like yeah yeah that's right that's right and then he looked at me one day and he was like you never just was sitting around with a friend and your friend said let's go break stuff yeah okay and I was like no (laughs) (laughs) I was that was going to be my next question was like you know if you have guys kind of you know proofread and and verify that that that's something guys do and (laughs) offer their suggestions described getting a bad taste in his mouth as eating laundry detergent and you know in my critique group the females are like yeah why would you eat laundry detergent it's like yeah yeah i can understand that yeah you just ate some laundry detergent yeah. <laughs> like tide pods <laughs> right right <laughs> the tide <laughs> you, I dare you to, okay. yeah the tide pod challenge um so ebony what is next for the series how many books do you have planned for it where are you in the writing process 
content. Um, some people think the way that I title the series is a little confusing because it seems to be counting backwards, but I already have the series titles planned, and the last one ends with a one. So starting from four, it's, there's got to be four books. Um, I finished book two, and I submitted it to 4814, and it's still under evaluation, so I'm just waiting for their nay. I'm really, really hoping for that yay. And while I wait, what I'm doing now is just writing, like, little short stories set in the world. Um, you know, just cut scenes and stuff, gathering them together. Because I'm like, okay, when I really kick it off again, I need to have a mailing list. Because that's one thing that I don't have. Mm-hmm. And I've been reading up on how to do that. And I know you have to be able to offer a lot of freebies and such to interest people. And people just like free stuff. And then, you know, I want to print, like, you know, little books that I can give out when I go to conventions. Like, hey, you know, buy the book, get this for free. So that's what I'm working on now. And the reason why I'm not going right into book three, though I have a loose outline of books three and four, is um, when I first submitted the fourth piece, the publisher was fine with it, but it, the ending was too lackluster. So they were like, okay, the ending needs to change. And because I changed the ending of the fourth piece, well, I was already halfway through the sequel, the original sequel, and everything I'd written for like six months had to go in the garbage because the ending changed. Yeah, the domino so I effect. I have to do that for book three. Mm-hmm. So I'm waiting for the acceptance and then for the ending to no that makes perfect sense because it it does have that domino effect and I've been um I've been tentative as well sometimes if I've had part of a continuous series with a publisher at any point and um because that that does happen um Mm -hmm. so you said you're working on a mailing list is that up now or forthcoming you know that's one thing I really want somebody to mentor me on mailing list because I was like okay I can go ahead and throw it up but I feel that I don't have enough free materials to get out and then I feel bad because you know the fourth piece came out 2016 so I feel like well what I have to offer is an old book and (laughs) I really don't or can't say anything about when the second book is coming out so I was like well my mailing list might not be that exciting now so maybe I should hold off until I know news about the second book and then I can kick it off with hey this book but this one's coming out soon and here's some in-between stuff you know um it's never it's never too early and you're never too um you're never too unequipped to, to, for lack of a better word, sorry, it's late. It's late here in Detroit <laughs> to start your mailing list. I tell authors all the time because I, I know authors who like their first book isn't even out yet. Like it's slated to be released next year. And they're like, well, I don't really feel right starting a mailing list because I don't even have anything. Even still, it's never too early to at least just start collecting those email addresses so that when you do have the release, then you at least have um, an audience to blast it to. Um, I would recommend, I don't know if they're still around and if they're still doing the same thing uh, that they've been doing because I know they, like all these uh, great tech companies like Facebook and Google, they always change things up. Like every couple of months, it's like a totally different <laughs> different layout. And, you know, um, but for, for mailing lists, I have worked with a company called Author Platform Rocket. Um, it's run by a guy called Johnny Andrews. Um, and I can't think of um, the girl's name, Ariel, um, Ariel something. Um, Ariel Burns, that's the one. Thank you. I- are you serious? Yes. She's she she's fabulous, isn't really she? Yes, Ariel Burns is the person. I mean, she's the one I learned everything from. I listened to all her webinars. I um I had subscribed to their service. So yeah, definitely if you've met her in person then and you have that that personal connection, she is fabulous. Definitely utilize her as a mailing list resource because I know she is killing it with her mailing list and my other publisher Limitless uses them um and uses has used their company and their methods and I know like when Limitless has um they have a they have a mailing list if you go to limitless.net um, or maybe it's limitlesspublishing.net, I'm sorry. Um, they have a, a sign up for a mailing list and every Friday they send freebie Friday and they send a number of like free eBooks <laughs> uh, because they publish a few hundred books, like 200 titles a year. So they've got a, a big back catalog to, um, you know, to, to rotate freebies. And, um, and it's very, it's very effective. I think they have like well over 10,000 subscribers and, you know, you just watch your books ranking soar to like, 
you know, top 100 in category um, yeah. when you have like a 99 cent sale or a freebie sale. So it's, um, it's definitely, yeah, um, that's why I would recommend. That's awesome that you know her. It is a small world in the small and indie publishing community, as I always <laughs> say. So until you have that mailing list set up, Ebony, where can we find you? Lovely. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time with me this evening. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening slash night slash <laughs> slash what's left of the day over there in Cali. <laughs> right, right, right. And Ask um, me what meal I'm getting ready to eat. Yeah, are you going to have? Yeah, there you go. What are you having for dinner? Anything special? I'm going to have lunch. Not dinner, but lunch. <laughs> oh, no. Are you still at work? You know, it's funny for breakfast, lunch, there's brunch, but we still don't have that word for dinner, lunch, <laughs> the lunch. Uh, but see, I'm greedy. I can't have dinner, or lunch, so I'm still gonna have dinner. You're still gonna have dinner I'm later. Have yep. One in the morning, so it's you know, dinner will be at like nine o'clock. So like, like uh, Spanish style, that <laughs> European style late dinner. Exactly. <laughs> So on that note, folks, that about does it for the interview tonight. If you like what you just listened to, please subscribe here on YouTube, youtube.com slash ckbrook. That's brook with an E on the end. And also check me out at ckbrook.com. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of via the handy contact form. And be sure to subscribe to my newsletter to see what I'm up to. And hey, pick up some some of my free ebooks as well. Ebony, it was a pleasure and please let us know uh, when you have news on your next book I have a feeling it will most likely get that yay from 4814 and um, and if so we would love to have you back for another round when you've got your new release coming up all right well thank you so much for having me this was a lot of fun and like I say um, like you're saying you were marveling at my process like wow look at all these reviews she's getting I look at you like okay how is she doing all this and <laughs> with all the social medias I think you're awesome oh my gosh well I would be happy to share um all of my trade secrets with you um like I've said before on the show it is really just throwing a lot of wet noodles at the wall and seeing what sticks <laughs> but <laughs> uh-huh. but I'm an open book I will share anything with you so um feel free you know to like shoot me an email and um and I'll let you know you know any of my resources and that goes for you listening as well I'm um I'm very open about stuff like that no secrets here in the indie publishing community we're all a big family I agree all right Ebony thanks so much again and have a great evening